Um, to, now, I'll, I'll tell you something about the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, the 18th century German philosopher. Then we'll break for 10 minutes, and then after the break, I'll say something about Hegel and uh, Marx. Now, not that it matters philosophically, but it matters historically. Kant lived from 1724 to 1804. Now, his main works are three. He wrote quite a lot, but his three works are the following main or principal books. Uh, firstly, the Critique of Pure Reason, the Critique of Pure Reason, Kritik der Heinen Vernunft, which goes through two editions. There's a 1781 edition and there's a 1787 edition. Now, usually this sort of fact is only of scholarly interest and isn't very important for trying to solve philosophical problems. But in the, ca in the case of Kant, there are important philosophical differences between the, the first version of the Critique of Pure Reason and the second version, the 81 and the 87 version. The other two books, <coughs> which are of considerable significance for understanding Kant's philosophy, are the so-called Critique of Practical Reason, Critique of Practical Reason, which came out in 1788, and the Critique of Judgment, which was published in 1790. Now, uh, the, the, crit the Critique of Judgment contains Kant's aesthetics, his philosophy of art, and his, up to a point, his philosophy of the beauty of nature. The Critique of Practical Reason contains Kant's uh, moral philosophy, but nearly everything I'll say today is about the critique of pure reason, which is essentially an epistemology book. In other words, an attempt to answer philosophical questions about knowledge. Now, in the critique of pure reason, the, Kant sets himself two main questions. Number one, is metaphysics possible? And number two, how is knowledge possible? Now, by metaphysics, Kant means knowledge of reality as opposed to appearance, or knowledge of the whole, the totality, as opposed to the part. And in the second uh, question, how is knowledge possible? By knowledge, Kant means the knowledge we already have empirical knowledge, knowledge of mathematics, uh, perhaps based on those two, scientific knowledge. He thinks that Newtonian's uh, physics is uh, essentially correct and essentially the whole of uh, physics. Now, the first question, is metaphysics possible? Kant answers in the negative. He thinks it's completely impossible to gain any knowledge through that branch of philosophy or alleged branch of philosophy called metaphysics. Now, in order to begin to understand why Kant thinks this, we have to understand the title of the book, The Critique of Pure Reason, or Kritik der reinen Vernunft. Now, by critique, Kant means drawing the limits to or showing the limitations of, or establishing what cannot and can be established by that technique. By reason, Kant means thinking, especially uh, logical thinking. Reason is something a priori, in the sense that it's a purely intellectual exercise, according to Kant. And by pure, he means non empirical or not contaminated by any findings of sense experience. So that's what the title's about. He's offering us a critique of pure reason or he's criticizing or drawing limits to what we can find out just by thinking, what we can find out by that. Now, um, obviously in all these lectures, the portraits I'm giving of these thinkers a fairly broad brush. 
and there's a, a, a density of argument and terminology that uh, is not really present in these lectures. But I'll, I'm giving you a sort of a roadmap or, or, or some sort of map to find your way through these, uh, through these people. But I'll have to say something about Kant's terminology now in order to understand why he rejects metaphysics. Kant thinks that if metaphysics were possible, if metaphysics were possible, then the sentences or the propositions of metaphysics would be synthetic a priori. They would be synthetic a priori. Now, what does synthetic mean? If a claim or a sentence or a theory or a belief is synthetic, it means it is informative or non-tautological or not just true by definition or as Kant uh, puts it, in a synthetic judgment, the predicate is not contained in the subject. Synthetic is the opposite of analytic. Analytic means true by definition, or true in virtue of meanings, or true in virtue of logical or linguistic facts alone. So Kant is saying that if there were any genuine metaphysical claims, or if there were any genuine metaphysical knowledge, the logico-epistemological status of such claims would be synthetic. On the other hand, on the other hand, any such claims, according to Kant, would be a priori, would be a priori. In other words, decidable purely intellectually, or you'd be able to work them out in your head, or you would arrive at the knowledge purely by thinking. Now, Okay, if that's the if, if those if those are the technical terms, a priori is the opposite of a posteriori, which means empirical or decidable only through experience, in particular sense experience. If that's the, the terminology, we can try to obtain an intuitive idea of what Kant means. Now, if we take some claims that are metaphysical, for example, number one. Uh, God exists, or number two, there was a first event, or number three, um, there is life after death, or number four, there is the hope of resurrection, or uh, number five, God made the universe. I mean, these are fairly uncontroversially uh, metaphysical claims. Um, these are, these sorts of claims count as a priori according to Kant, because we could only establish them through thinking. It's through logic or reasoning or trying to puzzle them out that we could arrive at them. But secondly, these claims are synthetic because they would come as news or they would come as genuine information about reality. These claims are not just linguistic claims or purely logical claims but come as information about the universe or its ultimate, ultimate nature. So uh, the intuitive idea is that um, if metaphysics were possible, you ought to be able to sit in your leather armchair in New College for six or 20 years and figure out that God exists or figure out that there's life after death. In other words... Metaphysics is armchair philosophy or pure, a purely intellectual enterprise. Now, it's that that Kant thinks is completely impossible. He thinks that's completely impossible. This figuring out in your mind or your brain, sitting in your armchair, ultimate facts about reality can't be done, in his view. Um, we could put in brackets. He doesn't mean people don't try and do it. He doesn't mean that people like, uh, uh, well, people like me, I suppose. He, 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 doesn't mean that, he doesn't mean that there aren't foolish, misguided individuals who spend decades trying to figure out the nature of reality through thinking, through thinking about it. But he, but he thinks it's utterly misguided and uh, a completely impossible enterprise. Now, uh, towards the end of this lecture, I'll, if there's time, I'll try and point out that this pessimistic view of metaphysics or this anti 
metaphysical view has been enormously influential on subsequent philosophy. Enormously influential on subsequent philosophy. So much so that the various movements in post-Kantian philosophy between then and now, uh, structuralism, phenomenology, logical positivism, logical atomism, dialectic and so on, by and large, these movements in philosophy all operate within a Kantian paradigm, or all operate within the parameters of the critique of pure reason. So over the last 200 years, on the view that I'm suggesting, we've been thinning out the implications of the critique of pure reason in philosophy, and uh, we haven't really managed to do very much else. One or two individuals have managed to punch out of the Kantian paradigm, but they're in a very small, disparate uh, minority. In brackets again, of course, this isn't to suggest that philosophers since Kant realize that they're operating within the critique of pure reason. Typically, they're wholly ignorant of this fact. Now, um, the critique of pure reason is divided into four main sections. Number one, an introduction. Number two, a section called the aesthetic or the transcendental aesthetic. Number three, a section called the analytic or the transcendental analytic. And number uh, four, the dialectic or the transcendental analytic. Uh, dialectic. Now, in the um, in the introduction, uh, Kant just covers the ground that I've mentioned already. In the introduction, he defines metaphysics, says he's going to inquire into meta into whether metaphysics is possible, and says that if um, if there were any metaphysical claims, their uh, status would be synthetic a priori. Maybe write SAP uh, in capital sort of synthetic a priori. I mean, you know, Hegel uh, rightly points out that uh, Kant's terminology is rather uh, barbarous and uh, long winded and convoluted, and one's inclined to agree with uh, Hegel in this combination until one begins to read Hegel itself. <laughs> Now, it, now, the aesthetic, I'll call this the first part of the book, even though you know, it's, it's after the introduction. Now, now, the aesthetic, this section of the critique of pure reason is not about um, art or, uh, or the philosophy of beauty. The aesthetic, aesthetic here is used in, with its ancient Greek connotation of pertaining to sense experience or to do with the senses. But in the aesthetic, uh, Kant says, well, the aesthetic is about space and time. The aesthetic is about space and time, or space-time, as we would uh, call it. Now, in the aesthetic, Kant produces arguments for the conclusion that any possible object of experience is spatio-temporal. Any possible object of experience is spatio-temporal. In other words, we self-conscious human beings are not constituted in such a way as to be able to make sense of any reality that's not spatio-temporal. Space and time are, as he puts it, necessary for experience or necessary conditions for experience. He says that space and time are forms of intuition. This is his expression, forms of in intuition. He means by this that space and time are the modes or manners in which human beings experience. We experience spatio-temporally. Now, this has a very important consequence for the rest of Kant's philosophy, which is as follows. If you think of something, if you think of something, you can only think of it as spatio-temporal. You can only think of it as spatio-temporal. Right? Or if you imagine something, you can only imagine it as spatio-temporal. Spatio-temporality is a constraint on our... Uh, 
on our minds, on our imaginations. So even if you think of uh, time, according to Kant, you use your imagination in a so-called figurative way. You think of time as a line, or perhaps as a circle, or perhaps as a road stretching out in front of you or behind you. In other words, our thinking is spatio-metaphorical. Now, this will be important for Kant for the rest of the book because there's a kind of empiricism that Kant endorses, or we could put it this way. Kant thinks that he is synthesizing or reconciling empiricism and rationalism in his philosophy. He thinks he's combining empiricism and rationalism into one philosophy, but to my mind, um, the rationalist has to make more of a sacrifice than the empiricist, roughly metaphysics has to be sacrificed, in view that there are synthetic a priori propositions which are uh, metaphysical has to be sacrificed. Now, so the idea is that um, the idea is uh, in, uh, as the book goes on if you he can't says we only know appearances we only know appearances he says this over and over again in the book he says, we have no knowledge of things in themselves. We only know appearances. We have no knowledge of things in themselves. Now, when Kant says, we only know appearances, he means when you think of your room in Blackfriars, or when you think of your flat in Oxford, or when you think of your flat in New York, if you've got one, uh, you can only imagine your flat as though you were perceiving it. If you know something or have knowledge of it, you can only know it as though you were perceiving it. Now this is an enormous constraint on human understanding, an enormous constraint on human knowledge. This is what he means when he says we only know appearances, we don't know things in themselves, i.e. we don't know things as they are in themselves. We don't, know, we don't have access to things as they are in themselves. We only have access to things as appearances or as they appear to us. Now, put in brackets, uh, most commentators from um, Hegel to uh, Peter Strawson and from um, uh, have understood appearances to be psychological items or mental items. But I see nothing in Kant that forces this um, interpretation. Appearances don't have to be psychological or mental uh, items. There's nothing in the word, in the German word, Erscheinung, which suggests that appearances have to be uh, mental. What I have in mind is the following. Um, uh, a BMW could appear around a street corner, um, Beaumont Street in St. Giles, uh, say, uh, but some sense data could not appear around a street corner, or some human sense impressions couldn't appear around a straight street corner. Now, when Kant talks about appearances, he means things as they appear, things as they appear. He doesn't mean psychological items like sense data or impressions or uh, something like, or ideas in the broad empiricist sense, something like that. So the conclusion of the aesthetic is that all our knowledge is spatio-temporal, or perhaps more cautiously, uh, there is no knowledge unless there's knowledge of spatio-temporal items. Now, in the second part of the book, in the, uh, an in the analytic, Kant says that there are certain fundamental concepts, which he calls categories, which are 12 in number. There are only 12 uh, categories. And these concepts, called categories, are indispensable 
for experience. Any being that experiences has to be equipped with the 12 categories. And those concepts called categories include, for example, existence, uh, non-existence, causation, substance, property, uh, plurality, unity, totality. I mean, in no particular uh, order, these are examples of concepts that he understands to be uh, categories. Now, um, Hegel criticizes Kant's philosophy for having uh, 12 fixed ahistorical uh, categories, meaning concepts which don't change historically. But this uh, might not be a drawback to Kant's philosophy for the following reason. Kant thinks that Possessing the categories is necessary for possessing any concept. So any concept user is a category user. Secondly, Kant thinks that the categories are concepts presupposed by any conceptual scheme. Kant knows that there are different conceptual schemes. He's an an Enlightenment thinker or a late Enlightenment uh, writer. He knows about exploration of other cultures. He's not uh, dismissive of the idea that concepts vary from person to person or culture to culture, but all those concepts are empirical. The root concepts called categories presupposed by any such conceptual scheme don't vary because they're necessary for experience. Because they're necessary for experience, Kant thinks that no experience can refute their uh, nature or their, applica their applicability. Now, Kant says that the concepts are a priori. Now, this is an odd thing for a philosopher to say, that the, the concepts called categories are a priori, because normally we think of beliefs or knowledge or propositions or sentences uh, as a priori. In, all, in other words, normally we think of a priori uh, being a priori as a property of truth-valued items, items that could be true and could be false. But normally we don't think of categories as true or false. Now, the, 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 the resolution of this is that he's using a priori in a special sense here. Um, a priori as a property of the categories means, number one, not acquired empirically or not acquired through any Lockean process of abstraction. So the categories, uh, causation, substance, existence, and so on, are not straightforwardly empirical. They're not like uh, red. Uh, now, secondly, by a priori here, Kant means necessary for experience. Now, there's, if you like, a third connotation to his use of a priori as a predicate applied to uh, categories. On most readings of Kant, Kant thinks that the categories are imposed on experience. In other words, Kant thinks that we conceptually structure our experience using the categories, or we judge our experience to be of a particular nature by imposing substance, causality, existence, unity, plurality, reciprocity, and so on, on our experience. Now, on this view, uh, Kant, on this view, Kant thinks that Perception is essentially preconception. Perception is essentially preconception. Now, on this third reading, where uh, a priori means imposed on experience cognitively or intellectually, perceiving something always and everywhere involves interpreting it, or objects as objects of perception are constituted partly by our perception uh, of it. Now, um, there's an in, there, most commentators on uh, Kant 
from <coughs> Hegel to Peter Strawson and Jonathan Bennett in the 60s and since Henry Allison in America uh, have assumed that Kant is some sort of idealist. Now, idealism is the view that the external world depends on consciousness or there is no external world or only consciousness exists or uh, the appearance of the external world to consciousness exhausts the existence and essence of the external world. On idealism, uh, what passes for reality is mind dependence. Now, we have to be immensely cautious about ascribing to Kant um, idealism of any of these strengths or varieties. It's definitely right that Kant's name for his own philosophy is transcendental idealism. He calls his philosophy uh, transcendental idealism. Uh, but I think that by idealism here, Kant does not mean idealism in the senses that I just summarized. Kant means anti-realism. Anti-realism. Now, anti-realism is the claim that some, some sentences are neither true nor false. Some sentences are neither true nor false. In a way, you know, in brackets, in a way, everybody agrees with this because questions are not true or false, they're obeyed or disobeyed or ignored. Uh, imperatives, I mean they're answered or not answered, imperatives are, are neither true nor false, they're obeyed or disobeyed, and, and so on, close, close brackets. But Kant is a metaphysical anti-realist. He thinks that claims like God exists, or there is life after death, or there was a first event, or God made the universe, Claims like this are neither true nor false. Now, this is my interpretation of uh, Kant. Kant as a metaphysical anti-realist. The usual, the usual interpretation of Kant, if you read the secondary literature, is that Kant thinks that these metaphysical propositions are either true or false. They are either true or false. But it's terribly difficult for human beings to find out which. It's terribly difficult for human beings to find out the fact of the matter about whether there was a first event or not, or whether there's a, or whether there's a God or not. Uh, and the reason for that is that we're not cognitively equipped to do it. We're not cognitively equipped to do it. The, the very same categories, the very same categories uh, that enable us to interpret experience have no application outside experience have no application outside experience. And that's the main conclusion of the part of the book called the, uh, called the, called the analytic. Um, now there's a certain, you see, the, the categories in the analytic, according to Kant, only apply to spatio-temporal items, or the categories only apply within experience. And the concept of God or the concept of the uh, soul or the concept of oneself as an immaterial subject, Kant thinks that these are illusions produced by the misuse of categories. The, the, the right use of the category of substance is to apply to a physical object, something in space-time, uh, an, an item to be met with within experience. But um, when we try to use concepts like substance, existence, or uh, causation to apply outside space-time, outside our experience, we produce the illusory concepts of God, the soul, the origin of the universe. But these are illusory shadows, so to speak. Um, we, we can't understand ourselves as uh, objects because we're subjects. Um, we don't seem to be straightforward with physical objects, therefore we must be mental objects or spiritual objects. This is an illusion. Or the cause of the physical universe on pain of circularity can't be a physical object, so it must be a non-physical uh, object, uh, perhaps of infinite or inordinate uh, power. And this is an Ill illusory use of the categories of um, 
uh, causation and uh, existence and substance and unity and so on. Now, in, in other words, there's a certain irony, according <coughs> to Kant here, it's exactly those 12 fundamental concepts which at one, of the, at one and the same time enable us to have the knowledge that we do have, but limit that knowledge so that there's no such thing as metaphysical knowledge. Now, the analytic, that part of the book, includes a sub-chapter, an extensive sub-chapter that's rewritten for the second edition, called the deduction, the, du the deduction, or uh, the uh, transcendental deduction. This word uh, transcendental that Kant uses an awful lot. Um, uh, this word transcendental means um, necessary for experience or pertaining to the necessary conditions for experience or to do with the prerequisites for knowledge. Now Kant sharply distinguishes transcendental in the senses that I've just described from transcendent. Transcendent means com something completely different. Transcendent means metaphysical or beyond experience or pertaining to a reality uh, not accessible empirically. So transcendental and transcendent are <clears throat> Not quite opposites in Kant's philosophy, but they're, in a sense, uh, pulling in opposite directions. Now, having quite often, having drawn a distinction fairly carefully like that, Kant goes on to carelessly uh, forget it. So, um, if you uh, are especially interested in this, to read the critique of pure reason, you shouldn't be too dismayed or annoyed if he gets mixed up about when he means transcendent and when he means transcendental. Uh, but obviously, transcendental is the status of the claims in the Critique of Pure Reason. His own philosophy is transcendental, but the philosophies that he's attacking, noticeably uh, Plato, Leibniz, uh, Descartes, uh, are transcendent or putatively transcendent or would be transcendent. Now, I mentioned this notion of synthetic a priori again at this point. Um, had there been any genuine metaphysical knowledge, it would have been synthetic a priori. But Kant thinks that there are genuine synthetic a priori propositions which are not metaphysical. He thinks there are some real synthetic a priori claims uh, which are not um, metaphysical. For example, Kant thinks that w with the exception of uh, certain definitions and axioms, the whole of arithmetic and the whole of uh, geometry is synthetic a priori, or the sentences of arithmetic and uh, geometry are uh, synthetic and a priori. In other words, they both come, come as news and you can decide them purely, in, purely intellectually. A second example, Kant thinks that the fundamental principles of Newton's physics are all synthetic a priori. Uh, the laws of thermodynamics, in fact most Newtonian laws, are synthetic a priori according to uh, Kant. And there, there, there are also, in the third category, certain philosophical principles, certain philosophical principles which are synthetic a priori. For example, Kant thinks that every event has a cause is synthetic a priori. He thinks it's not empirical. Now, I should say that uh, in this picture that's emerging so far, this anti-metaphysical picture, Kant is strongly influenced by Hume, by Hume. When I was talking about Hume, I said that there are six or eight uh, concepts that Hume thinks are not straightforwardly empirical. Well, there's an overlap between those concepts and the concepts that Kant is calling uh, categories, notably the concept of causation is important to both uh, philosophers. But Kant 
say that it was uh, Hume who awoke him, Kant, from his dogmatic slumbers. In other words, it was Hume who made Kant interested in philosophy, or at least this kind of critical philosophy. Now, in the transcendental deduction, there are two things, real two relevant points about it, about the deduction. Number one, Kant says he's going to justify the categories. He's going to produce arguments that all and only the 12 categories are the a priori concepts that are necessary for experience and misused in the attempt to do metaphysics. That's the first thing he's going to do. Now, unfortunately, he never gets round to that because point two is a theory of the self, which at this point seems to have suddenly interested Kant far more than the uh, categories. And again, in the theory of the self, Kant replies to Hume. Remember, Hume thinks that there's no single idea which gives rise to the idea of self that could be found in introspection. Um, and Hume says that uh, mankind is a bundle of perceptions, a bundle of perceptions, meaning you are a bundle of perceptions, I am a bundle of perceptions, she is a bundle of perceptions. As far as introspection is concerned, each of us is a bundle of perceptions, even though, um, well, it means that Hume is a kind of Buddhist. I just put that in brackets because he clearly doesn't know, he doesn't realise that he's a kind of Buddhist, but never mind. Now, uh, Kant is interested roughly in the question, what holds Hume's bundle together? What holds Hume's bundle together? Now, like everybody else uh, who's written since Descartes, with a few exceptions, Kant is, goes to enormous pains not to conclude that a Cartesian soul uh, or consciousness as a substance holds Hume's bundle uh, together. What holds Hume's bundle together is the possibility of self-consciousness, the possibility of self-consciousness. Now, Kant calls the possibility of self-consciousness uh, the transcendental unity of apperception. I apologize uh, for this terminology, but the possibility of self-consciousness has a special term in Kant, the transcendental unity of apperception. Transcendental because it's uh, necessary for uh, experience. You can't experience without a unified mind. Um, Unity, because it holds Hume's bundle of perceptions together. Apperception, because it's a kind of self-consciousness. Apperception is a name or a word that Hume takes from Leibniz. It's Leibniz's uh, word for self-consciousness. Or even without self-consciousness, there's a kind of representation and self-representation in Leibniz called apperception. For example, the relationship between each monad and every other monad is one of apperceptual, at least as a kind of self-consciousness of monad is related to itself through apperception. Anyway, he takes it from Leibniz. Now, um, Kant says in the uh, deduction, it must be possible for the I think to accompany any of my perceptions. It must be possible for the I think to accompany any of my perceptions. Now, what does he mean by the I think? He puts it in italics, or he's published it as a uh, of one uh, Now, it must be possible for the I think, the ish denker, the ish denker, to accompany any of my perceptions or perhaps presentations, Vorstellungen, or presentations. Now this means that for the unity of consciousness to be possible, any thought of mind, any thought of mind, must be amenable to being had self-consciously. In other words, uh, for any thought that P, it must be possible to preface that thought with, I think that P, I think that P, 
Now, of course, this, I think, this Ishdenka is dangerously close to Descartes' cogito or Descartes' je pense. But Kant thinks that self-consciousness consists in one thought being about other thoughts. Right? That's what self-consciousness is. One thought being about other thoughts. And that's what the unity of consciousness consists in. That possibility. The poss that's what holds Hume's bundle together. One thought can be about any or some or all of my thoughts. And that's what the unity of consciousness consists in. In particular, Kant denies that the self is a soul. The Cartesian and Platonic idea that the individual person is essentially a soul is another misuse of the category of substance, category of existence, and possibly unity and causation beyond space-time or outside space-time. Now, I should mention a refinement here which bears on the aesthetic, the first part of the book, and that is that Kant says that, um, that time is the form of inner sense. Time is the form of inner sense. And uh, space is the form of outer sense. He also says that time is the mediate form of outer sense, the mediate form of outer sense. In other words, uh, Kant draws um, a self-external world distinction or a mind-external world distinction by saying that uh, the self or the mind is essentially temporal but the external world is essentially spatio-temporal. Okay, now, in the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, which is called the capital B edition, the first edition is called the capital A uh, edition, in the B edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant includes a brand new chapter that's not at all in the first edition. And the brand new chapter is called The Refutation of Idealism. The Refutation of Idealism. Now Kant includes the refutation of idealism in the Critique of Pure Reason in the second edition because he's utterly dismayed that he's been misunderstood as an idealist since 1781. So by 1787, he's trying to correct his mistake and explain that transcendental idealism is not a kind of idealism, but a kind of anti-realism. Anti now, Kant argues that two philosophies are mutually consistent and true. By mutually consistent, I mean the truth of one doesn't rule out the truth of the other. But they're also, they're also, they're also true. The first of these is transcendental idealism, and the second is empirical realism. Now, it's very important to notice that Kant claims to be an empirical realist. He says empirical realism is true. Now, what is empirical realism? What is empirical realism? Empirical realism is the doctrine that physical objects exist whether they are perceived or not. Physical objects exist whether they are perceived or not. Physical objects predate our perception of them. Physical objects post-date our perception of them, and their existing rather than not existing is in no way affected by our perception of them during our perception of them. And there were physical objects before there were any conscious beings, and there will be physical objects after any con conscious beings. This is empirical realism. Now, Kant says empirical realism is true. Now, in the refutation of idealism, he says that the philosophies of Descartes and uh, Berkeley are both false. Descartes is what Kant calls a sceptical idealist. According to Descartes, the existence of mind-independent physical objects is doubtful. But Berkeley, uh, Kant calls a dogmatic idealist. According to Berkeley, uh, the non-existence of mind independent physical objects is certain. Now, in the, um, in the refutation of idealism, Kant says 
I am conscious of my existence as located in time. I am conscious of my existence as located in time. Now, the, the word that I've translated as located is uh, bestimmt, and in the Norman Kemp Smith translation, which is normally an excellent translation, bestimmt is translated as uh, determined. Now, if you, look, if you care to look at the secondary literature, this has produced a huge red herring, sometimes argued with great uh, ingenuity, a red herring about free will and determinism. But free will and determinism but nothing to do with the refutation of idealism. Well, I hesitate to say that nothing has got nothing to do with it, but it doesn't really have much to do with it at all. Now, I'm conscious of my existence as located in time. That can only be true, that can only be true on the assumption that there is something permanent in perception. There's something permanent in perception. And uh, this, what, if we ask, well, what does permanent mean? What does permanent mean? What it means predates our perception of it, exists during our perception of it, and postdates our perception of it. And Kant says, uh, well, uh, in order to do this, uh, this job of um, facilitating this concept of myself as located in time, it must be the objects that I perceive. It must be the things that I, that I perceive. Now, if we look briefly at the last section of the book, the so-called dialectic, uh, it's here, really, that Kant argues that um, metaphysics is uh, impossible. In um, a chapter called The Antinomies, Kant considers four metaphysical problems. In the first antinomy, this is his terminology again, I apologise for it, he, try, he tries to decide whether the world has a beginning or no beginning. In the second antinomy, he tries to decide whether there are simples, i.e. Uh, things with no parts, or whether everything can be divided into something that has parts. In the third antinomy, he does discuss free will and determinism. And the uh, fourth antinomy is about whether there exists a necessary being or not. So beginning or no beginning, uh, simples or compounds, free will and determinism, and necessary being or no necessary being. Now, Kant defines uh, uh, an antinomy as a pair of deductive arguments. So two deductive arguments make up one antinomy. But in the case of an antinomy, the two deductive arguments have special features. Firstly, they both seem to be uh, valid. They both seem to be logically valid. Uh, but secondly, the two conclusions are mutually exclusive. The two conclusions are mutually exclusive. In other words, if one conclusion is true, the other conclusion is false. Now, in other words, Kant is saying that when we do metaphysics, we tend to produce equally plausible arguments for uh, the universe had a beginning and the universe had no beginning, or um, each thing can be infinitely divided, or a regress of divisions has to be halted by something that can't be divided, or that we have free will and that we've got no free will, or that there is a necessary being, God of course, or there is no necessary being. So in doing metaphysics, we can devise pairs of equally plausible arguments that lead to mutually exclusive conclusions. The, the existence of um, mutually exclusive conclusions is the existence of contradictions, according to Kant. In other words, cases of both P and not P, or cases of the conjunction of a proposition and its negation. Now, Kant, along with most philosophers, think that finding a contradiction in something is absolutely fatal. Uh, so uh, this is fatal for metaphysics. The attempt to do metaphysics generates contradiction. And uh, now we've got two interpretations of Kant. We can say, well, Kant thinks that it's terribly difficult to do metaphysics, but somebody might succeed one day. 
Or we can take the other view, according to which the only way out of these contradictions is to give up the idea, give up the idea that uh, metaphysical claims are true valued at all, that there is a fact of the matter about whether there was a first event or life after death or um, a beginning uh, that was caused by God and so on. Now, in the last couple of minutes, I'll just say that this uh, Kantian picture has been massively influential on subsequent philosophy. Um, if we take, for example, uh, logical positivism, the philosophy of the Vienna Circle in the 1930s, um, they think that metaphysics is impossible, or they think that there are no metaphysical propositions, or they think that uh, metaphysical claims are not truth value. Now, you might say there's an enormous difference between uh, the Vienna Circle and Kant, because the Vienna Circle think there are no synthetic a priori propositions, and that's right. The logical positivists think there are no synthetic a priori propositions at all, but Kant is willing to admit a class that's not metaphysical. That is a difference, but the upshot for uh, metaphysics is equally disastrous either way. Now, these ideas can be found for other particular reason, but especially in the introduction and in the dialectic. In the introduction, Kant introduces the analytic-synthetic distinction, which is essential to logical positivism. Then secondly, phenomenology, in a way, can be found in the difference between the aesthetic and the analytic. I think Husserl's phenomenology is essentially the reduction of the, uh, of the world of physical objects described in the analytic to the world of phenomena described in the aesthetic. And thirdly, um, conceptual analysis or Oxford linguistic philosophy, that, and structuralism, despite the fact that it's a slight um, are both anticipated in the section of the book called the analytic, because Kant says that it's the proper job of philosophy to understand the concepts and categories we use to understand the world, uh, rather than to understand the world itself. And that's exactly the project of structuralism and conceptual analysis. Now, in the final part of the book, Dialectic, uh, Kant calls the final part of the book Dialectic, and dia Dialectic is the name of the technique of problem solving employed by Hegel, and up to a point, Karl Marx. Now, Kant, of course, thinks that dialectic is a catastrophe that leads to contradictions. But Hegel, and up to a point Marx, see ways of overcoming or going beyond these contradictions. And Kant himself gave a hint of dialectic working when in the third antinomy, which is about free will and determinism, he says we're both free and determined. There's a lot more that can be said about the constitution of philosophy that goes on today in British and American universities uh, by Kant. But I think that very few of us have escaped this uh, Kantian paradigm. Okay, let's stop for 10 minutes and um, talk about Hegel and Marx.